I always do that too. Okay, we are now live. Um, we'll give it a few seconds to get some people getting in. Thank you for coming. Those who are coming in right now, we're just gonna give it a few minutes uh, as we're getting set up to let everyone enter. But thank you for joining us uh, for our continuing series uh, in webinars uh, through NextFab. Um, and thank you, Mark, for coming today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Anna. All right, we have a few more people coming in. Thanks for coming. Okay. Well, we can just dive in right into the topic. Um, sure. So I'm Anna. Uh, I'm next to sales manager. Uh, and today we're here with Mark Kuhn, who is CEO and founder, right? Correct? Yeah, one of the founders, yep. One of the founders of Oat Foundry. Uh, and the topic we're going to be covering today is something that's been uh, kind of unique uh, for Oat Foundry that you're switching production right now from what you're typically doing to helping a regional need, sure. uh, which I know is something that is needed and a lot of factories are actually interested in doing this as well. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to sort of talk about the journey, uh, what the, some of those decision points were. Uh, and specifically for people in the audience, if you have questions as we're going through this topic, please feel free to put questions down in the Q&A portion. And we are gonna save, uh, after the 30 minute interview, we're gonna have 30 minutes to actually go through those live questions and we can get a little bit deeper into topics uh, that might be helpful to you. Um, also, do not be afraid of saying things that are too specific or just specific to you. That's actually where we get a lot of good information that could be helpful. Sure. I'm, I'm excited about it. Yeah, me too. Um, well, just to jump in for, with you, Mark, do you want to tell us a little bit about Oat Foundry, um, you know, the creation behind it? Sure. Your, your tagline is you build cool stuff, so tell us about <laughs> that cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we started this company. We're coming up on seven years, uh, and it was me. It was five other mechanical engineers. We went to Drexel. Um, though kind of the seed for the start of our company was a, a pretzel factory vending machine uh, that we made for the Philadelphia pretzel factory. So the idea was, how can we use an engineering mindset, which is basically just systematic problem solving and creativity to create a vending machine for hot soft pretzels. So that was sort of like project number one. Um, and we, we looked at each other after completing that. We, we kind of said, like, we should start a company. That's a good idea with no business experience or any of that. Um, that kind of comes later. And the first year we were doing, we were leveraging those design skills with sim simpler projects, smaller projects, and some product design. Um, we were actually, that's how we were linked to NextFab as a company. Um, I think at one point we had five or so memberships. And Next, NextFab is a really great space, not to, not to advertise for your company, but NextFab is a great space for when you're figuring it out. And some people can use all the resources there forever. In Oat Foundry's case, we at a certain point needed to start building out our own shop. And so it made a, it was a really great transition to, to get us our footing underneath us and then help us kind of into this next phase. So we moved up to Ben Salem and we had a shop there for a little while, uh, growing both product and project scope. And so we were making things like you know, record dividers and custom interactions for brands. And, and those started to get bigger with time. Um, we're doing a lot of custom furniture and custom kind of millworking. Um, and then a, a big, certainly a big uh, change in Oat Founders history was this split flap display project. So we became the, the company, this was using our, our discovery, design development, fabrication process to create these, you know, these split flap signs. So we became known as the, as the split flap company. And so we went, we still do, Oat Foundry for sure still does all of the, the design services where companies, individuals come to us and go, you know, I just don't know how to, to make this thing. And I want to make a thousand of them. How do I do that? But we also sell our own products. So we have space here. We've moved from Ben Salem to Philadelphia to the Frankfurt Arsenal. Um, we have 6,500 square foot shop space here uh, with sort of another auxiliary space across the hall that's another 6,500 square feet. Wow. And we have all kinds of tools. We have routers and lasers and uh, electronics and it, uh, probably a lot of tools that are very familiar to you uh, at NextFab. Mm -hmm. um, and we use them for these, for these creations. So Oat Foundry actually has these, um, 
we have four core values that we put on the wall the build cool stuff growing purposefully giving a damn and and having fun so it's a pretty lighthearted atmosphere here despite yeah. all of the social distancing and ppe guidelines i'm i'm in my own little fishbowl right now but we normally do have to wear masks mm -hmm. um, at the office so so that's the the kind of the history of the company um, we've grown in staff from the original six of us to um, at one point i think we were 20 when we were doing a lot more um, some fabrications are our staff fluctuates depending on kind of the fabrication projects we're working on, but now we're 15. Um, mm -hmm. So we're 15 full time here. Uh, sales and marketing is still remote. I saw Jeff join the call. He's our marketing director. Uh, mm -hmm. So sales and marketing is still remote. Business development still remote. So production and engineering can be working safely here in the shop. Got it. Um, so to talk a little bit about getting into the, the current crisis and the current situation. Can you tell me a little bit about that moment when you decided Oat Foundry needed to be involved? You yeah. Know, what, what was that decision like? What prompted it? Yeah, so I think it really does go back to these, these core values. So the, the build cool stuff is one that's really easy to identify with. It's just, we want to build stuff that makes people go, damn, that's cool. Um, which is a good segue into give a damn. And we, we think that we have a social responsibility to um, to, to answer calls to action. So to answer uh, cries for help and need as it exists in the community. Uh, there's the t kind of the timeline here, Anna, was that mid-March, I think it was the 19th, uh, that Thursday the 19th is when Tom Wolf announced that they were gonna be shutting down non-life sustaining businesses. And, and uh, you know, my partners and I, we, we looked at each other and we said, we, we can, we have all of the, the Lego pieces of a life sustaining business. We just have to make the output of our Lego pieces that business. So split flaps, split flaps are not a life sustaining business. They're a really amazing, complex, engaging, really cool product. Yes. Uh, but right now they are not what is needed. What is needed are various kinds of PPE, various kinds of medical equipment. And so we kind of developed a plan very rapidly to get the, get the green light to run, um, which we got from the state kind of that, that uh, weekend, it would have been the 22nd, I think Sunday, and then starting off our process. So we did discovery. Uh, we looked at, there's some core assumptions around what we're making. So I, I, for anyone who's on the call, um, we started making these, the face shields were sort of the fastest um, product that we could get out. And what we, what we said was, uh, right now, supply chains are in turmoil. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to find certain things. We are in a. We have the skill sets here to be able to find some of those things. So people who are really good at procurement um, and the relationships, so we know where to go, where to look, who the suppliers are. But the the speed at which we could get a product into use, that was it. Let's just get. Let's get something in as fast as possible. That's also very sturdy and durable, so it can be used as long as possible. Those are like the core assumptions. Yeah. Um, so we started our. We looked at the Lego pieces we have. We have. Uh, some routers, we have a laser, we have uh, competent assembly technicians, mm -hmm. and we have design engineering skills. And so we started this process of coming up with, I think it's actually part of it's like, <laughs> literally on the, I, almost, I only noticed that on this call, it was not on purpose, um, but part of the whiteboarding session was yes. here. And what we did was we, uh, we started prototyping and then reaching out to some healthcare professionals and saying, you know, what do you, what do you like? Like, do you like this? Do you like it? Do you not like it? What do you hate about it? What do you love about it? And I've seen, you know, there's so many, you know, people say there's, there's, you know, so many ways to skin a cat. We always joke that out of 13 possible solutions, 11 are correct. You really just have to pick one. Yeah. Um, and so some of the feedback we got was about for durability, for reusability, you know, staying away from some of the elastics and some of the other foams that were out there. And maybe making that a dispose, maybe that part's a disposable, but the core unit is reusable. Um, and so there's, yeah, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat, but we chose some, some specific ones that worked for us that we knew we could build. Um, so that was that Monday. And then really Wednesday is when we started kind of this assembly process of, of building these. And then Thursday that week we were testing them. So this is like the whole, this, yeah. all of that truncated down into a kind of a week um, wow. with it being all hands on deck. Um, and then we started shipping them. So that was, and then it was really only about a week later that we were in full tilt production, kind of scaling up to do, I think we're at about a thousand a day, maybe 1500 a day now. So we do about 5,000 a week. Yeah. 
Um, we knew that we were going to have to hire on some some more people, so we reached mm -hmm. out to uh, we reached out to a couple of restaurant groups in the area who circulated our kind of our call to action um, for our own community, and we we found some new assembly technicians to come in and help us: Jill, sure. Rebecca, Dan, and Brendan. Um, and so they've been diligently just chugging away and putting these things together in addition to, in addition to our own team. So it sounds like a, this decision really was driven by a business need. You know, you didn't, is it correct that you were like, this is the way that we won't shut down. Um, you want to keep your people employed uh, or yeah. was it sort of a balance? No, it's both. So it's, you know, businesses really aren't magic. They, mm -hmm. they require some input uh, yeah. in the form of, raw materials, inventory, and revenue, and they have output, which is products and, and paying their people. So we, we did look at, you know, we built this whole company around optionality, Oat Foundry, and I wish I could show you a tour of the back space. Maybe I can figure out how to hold my laptop up later, but, um, but we have workstations that are part of an assembly line. So mm -hmm. each workstation has a different functionality. There's all kinds of buckets with the different pieces that someone has to put a split flop together or put a face shield together or put some other piece of equipment together. And then we develop standard operating procedures and work instructions and quality standards around those. So there's not really a big secret, even for the massive manufacturing companies in the world, um, there's not too many big secrets about how to do this. It's a process that you have to go through to set up these systems um, to train employees on what the, the different steps in assembly are. And so to answer your question, you know, when we looked at it, we said, Sure, Oat Foundry has the option to simply shut down um, because we, like, there are many businesses that are shut down right now. We can tell our employees that everyone's going to be furloughed or we're going to have to let them go. We're going to have to close the doors and, and weather the storm. Um, that was certainly one option on the table. But we also looked at not just the tools that we have in front of us, the skill sets of the people, um, but our core values, which is this, like, mm -hmm. you coming back to this give a damn. It was like, you know, we kind of have a, an obligation to at least give it a shot, like at least try to help in some way. Uh, yeah, so that, that's why we, it was, it was probably a split second decision. Should we close? Are we gonna weather the storm? Or are we gonna just like dive face first, feet first into this and figure out, figure out how to make something that actually causes change, actually affects change? I have been seeing this similar mentality for makers all over the world so that they seem to be some of the first people uh, responding to the call for this need, even if they don't know how to respond to the call. Right. Um, why do you, you know, what is that maker mentality that you think is in that core value that you have that, uh, give you, what advice could you give to those people? Across yeah, I think it's, um, uh, I, I think that there's a couple, there's a couple elements to that question, Anna. So the, mm -hmm. the idea of like, what's in a maker's mentality that, they wanted they they have this first responder mentality of like pitch in and help roll up your sleeves i think it's that we we make stuff we beat back entropy we we do this because it's not only gratifying but there's there is satisfaction in seeing uh the util something you've made have utility in the world mm -hmm. so there's some satisfaction there when you have ability to demonstrate ability and and have some kind of efficacy with what you're making um, i think we also do it cathartically i think we build to stay busy so we don't have to think about the massive crushing human questions that everyone is contemplating nowadays. And they, they're the ones that keep you up at night. So when I'm going to sleep, I'm not thinking about, you know, all of the, the thousands of people that are, that are hurting right now. I'm only thinking about what I can do to help them. So I keep my blinders up a little bit. Uh, that is to say every once in a while in my position as CEO, I have to take the blinders off and look at the whole game board and, and take some of that in. Um, yeah. But at least from, from an individual's perspective, knowing that you're helping. That's yeah. important. That keeps us going. I know whenever I feel down, um, whenever I'm feeling like particularly depressed or having a dark time, uh -huh. helping helps me break out of that. Helping yeah. someone else, put it, taking myself out of my own body and putting myself in someone else's, you know, uh, taking care of someone else's needs absolutely yeah. changes my brain chemistry whenever. So not that I'm, I'm qualified to talk about that. This is my personal anecdote. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's what I identify as like, it's, it's a way to, to stay sane and stay busy. And there's a lot of people out there that are altruistic. They want to help and they can by acting. Is this something as a business leader that you're actually encouraging your employees to really focus on your slice of the pie versus be overwhelmed by 
the the overarching need. Uh, the biggest thing I keep hearing is, you know, we can only do so much as individual businesses, and we have to realize that this is a group effort. So it can seem overwhelming, um, but if everyone does their piece, we can meet that need. Yeah, I think that's, um, it, it's a good question. I think the, the idea of it being overwhelming, you really do have to pick your battles and you have to choose at what point you're going to stop listening to other people and just start acting for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I know in these early days of, of this statewide shutdown and people were trying to get waivers to work, you know, we, we talked internally and we were like, not that we're like cowboys or anything, but we're like, what, what's going to happen right now? The, the damage of, of going to work when you're not supposed to be going to work is spreading the virus. So mm -hmm. we, we have to put in policies anyway to keep our employees safe. Okay, check that box. And then punitive damages? I mean, what's gonna happen? Like we think the the risk of not acting was higher than the, the punitive or risk of, of acting. And so mm -hmm. we, we got to work. I yeah. think you can put enough safety measures in place to keep people safe. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the, the risk is, uh, is unless that's controlled. So in my little microcosm, mm -hmm. in our little, the four walls of Oat Foundry, we kind of have a lot of control over that. We're not a thousand person plant that's worried about social distancing and, um, yeah. and having to have more oversight over that. We benefit from being able to move very quickly and nimbly um, and having this kind of ride or die mentality. So we looked at it and we said, yes, it's shut down, but, but if we don't get these face shields into the hands of healthcare professionals and food service workers and EMTs, that risk is higher. Hmm. For other people, you know, across the world, we're seeing uh, other countries are sort of either behind on us or they're starting to put uh, restrictions up uh, based on the spread of the virus. What advice would you give to those, you know, small manufacturer entrepreneurs who are thinking that maybe they should start preparing uh, or they need to mark a decision point of we're switching what we do day to day to this sort of new normal? Yeah, I think my, my advice to other manufacturers would be to, um, to, to set some, some structure in place about how you make decisions. So for us, it was gathering the leadership team and saying, um, okay, normally we review these types of products and production metrics maybe monthly. Now we're going to review them twice a week because things are changing so quickly. So an example is, you know, normally when we buy raw ingredients, we have a, a decent sense of what the cycle is going to look like for turning those into products that then ship out the door. Mm -hmm. For this, it's much more challenging because it fluctuates so, vol the, the, the volatility of it was through the roof. And so we'd say, you know, for Oat Foundry to spend $20,000 on sheets of plastic on a Monday, we might say, do we want to do this or not? Well, we need a little bit more like data. We need to see if, if people are actually interested in these or if we're kind of getting ahead of our skis. Tuesday morning, that plastic's gone. Someone else has bought it and is either hoarding it or maybe turning it into a good product, maybe not, who knows. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're trying to hold as little inventory as possible of raw materials so that other people can have access to it mm -hmm. while converting that raw material as fast as possible into a product. And then while having a sustainable chain to be able to get more when we need it. So balancing all of those requires you know, more than just my brain. Yes. Um, I would say making making some rigor, putting some rigor behind how you make decisions was part of it. Um, we looked at, at things like, you know, how much do these things need to cost for us to be able to keep this going as long as, as we need to keep it going. Um, I know there's a lot of businesses that, when I, what I would say is unless like Oat Foundry could, we could switch our whole production to a different thing and be making some different product forever. Um, but we'd have to come up with a couple of those to really like kind of keep the business going as a whole. Mm -hmm. So when I look at another company, I say, our experience has been, we, do, we actually don't want to be making face shields. We only want to be making them as long as they are needed by this community. Because eventually, they're the three M's of the world, the larger solutions will come back online. Um, and I think the preference, even though we know a lot of folks in healthcare love our reusable ones, mm -hmm. we, we think that the, the preference is after all this blows over, go back to disposable. We think a lot of people will... will kind of go back to disposable. Um, but we have seen traction for us for now, you know, grocery store employees are also on the front lines. They are fighting uh, to keep everyone fed and keep the stores stocked and, and going to work every day. And they don't want a disposable and they want something that's a little sturdier and a little bit more robust. 
um, so that they can wash them and kind of use them over again becomes a one-time expense. So what I say is, is have a product roadmap also in mind that you're evaluating um, if you're anticipating switching over. For us, the cost of switching over was not too high. We, had, we have a lot of the infrastructure here already. So it was a matter of moving benches around and, and moving some shipping equipment around to be able to fulfill it. If you're a smaller company or maybe you're an individual looking at, you know, making it a sustainable product requires some foresight also. So looking into not only like what your costs are gonna to be to set up a line, but also to change that line over once all of this goes away. Mm. So thinking six months in the future, three months in the future, whatever that two weeks in the future, try to yeah. live two weeks at a time. Um, yeah, you had asked a question too about, I think communication. So we, we use Slack for all of our in, intra office communication. Mm -hmm. um, and using that to also communicate because, because being remote is tough. So yeah. using that to keep similar messaging out because um, OatFunder had gone remote before we started doing the face shields. Like when it became apparent um, that, that this was more serious, I guess that would have been late February. Yeah. Um, we started communicating with employees and saying, hey, these groups are gonna be remote because it makes the most sense um, because we can, we can work remote uh, to, to be able to free up the shop space for whatever's coming. And so I, I would encourage that uh, other manufacturers to look at how you're handling remote work also, because it's all, if it's getting worse in your country, you're gonna have that need pretty soon. Do you think that some of these changes that you are currently implementing are gonna be longer lasting, you know, past our new normal, whatever our new normal looks like? Yeah. Um, like some of these work from home policies or the communication structure you have in place? or maybe even some of the products you're producing, could you see them going past this? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, that's like the shake the crystal ball type yeah. of question. Um, yes. And so let me, let me do the best I can. Okay. Um, Oat Foundry hired on a remote employee full-time before all this started. So he works out outside of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had to develop some of the skill sets that led to so how do you remote present to a client? How do you remote into your weekly update meetings? How do you foster culture is a huge one. Like that have fun as a core value. We want the remote employees to be able to enjoy that as much as the, the in office employees. And so we started, we got a little bit of a head start on this new normal, we're calling the new normal of remote work. And there are a lot of resources out there that I would encourage to, to other companies. Yes, I, to answer your question more succinctly, I do think that this, you know, we will see the fluidity with which we can get work done from home, how it's not so much different. You don't need everyone in the office um, more as, as our customers start to come online and realize the same thing. Um, my advice would be, excuse me, find ways to, to encourage and engender a healthy work-life balance and, and take advantage of some of those other more casual moments. So in an office, you know, someone, two people grabbing coffee or two people grabbing water or something like that. You can have these casual moments of both levity and also productivity where you say, hey, can I grab you for five minutes? Um, Oatfinder, I don't think has completely cracked that nut yet, but we're, we're certainly working towards it. You know, how do you have more spontaneous interaction? Because when you get, you, you go down your tunnel at home and you're, you put your head down, you work for 10 hours and you lift your head up and it's dark and you, you realize like, where did the day go? Yeah. That's kind of on one end of the spectrum and the other end is, is the employees who do much better working from home. You can wake up, you can get some work done, maybe do yoga, get some more work done. And so you, the total work day might be longer, but it's punctuated by more moments of self-care. Uh, and that can lead to, that beyond my observation has led to uh, dramatic increases in productivity just from a psychology perspective. A happier, a happier person working is happier overall. I think the shake the crystal ball for us, Anna, is you know, what industries are changing. So. You know, when we look at um, even for split flap, like th that's a product that had very strong sales for both sales and rentals. You yeah. know, if there's not going to be as many trade shows, those rentals are likely going to go down. And so not only how do we make up revenue with either that product or other products, but what is the rent, what does the trade show market look like a year from now yeah. or 18 months from now? Um, I think there's some, there's some pundits out there that do a better job than I, I will at, at pontificating what the future will look like. I think I've heard, you know, Zoom, obviously remote, you know, remote work, video conferencing, telephony through the roof, um, things like movie theaters and gyms, maybe not so much. Um, so certainly when Oat Foundry looks at who are the com companies that are gonna have need for our product design services, we do look at 
like what, what that could look like in the future. What are those companies that are going to be thriving? And they're out there. They're harder to find, but they're out there. So based on, from what it sounds like, you, you like to think about the future, but you're focused on the present. Is that true? Because um, there is so un much uncertainty there? Uh, or are yeah. you encouraging people to sort of have a balance of a foot in both worlds? Yeah, I would, I would say have a balance in both worlds. Um, I think it depends on, on, let me back up for a second. When I think about like worrying about the present, so I want to just make a distinction there. Worrying about the present is pernicious because that's one where you could spend all day worrying about something and not actually get anything done. And so taking a break from the news occasionally or choosing where you're going to get your news sources that are not inflammatory in the way that some, some news outlets can be um, very shocking titles that have a dramatic effect on us. So, so keeping even a, a check, bar, you know, check boxes on your board to say like, did I check the news today? Yes or no? And having some kind of metric behind that um, just to understand how it stresses you out. To be honest, it still keeps me up at night. Like I try as much as I possible, as much as I try to, to follow my own logic here, I still find myself worrying about it. And so I have to practice some self-discipline to, um, to knock that down. As far as keeping an eye on the future while also staying in the present, there's, there's kind of two ways to do that. Um, one is, so that the reason why I do that is because there will be life after coronavirus. It's certainly consuming many of our brain power and resources right now, but there will be a future. And so to envision that future, to, to make that future reality, you have to envision that future. Mm -hmm. um, and so making a decision and kind of backing in how to get what you want. For us, I have the benefit of multiple brains. So here at Oak Fund, so our leadership team is, um, is diverse and we have a lot of skill sets on there. So for me, you know, to think about the production and fulfillment of these orders, our president, Sean, who's one of my partners, he's, he is the expert at that. And so we can take it from my side, which is like getting these to the right people and handling that procurement to his brain as fast as possible so that I don't have to worry about how these are getting made. And I can trust that they are getting made perfectly every single time. Mm -hmm. So I would say, and this is, I mean, if you read any, any good kind of business uh, startup type of book, um, what's my favorite one is probably uh, Traction, I think is a really good, it's really good like operating system kind of for, for startups. The first thing that they espouse is building a leadership team. And so finding other people who are going to be pulling in the same direction as you, there's that famous quote is like, you know, we can't go it alone. I believe that. I think if, if you're a maker at home, get linked up with some of these communities, get on the cover aid, PHL, uh, Slack channel, and get involved to, to be linked to other people um, so you can be working towards kind of the same goal. If you're a manufacturer, it's working with your own leadership team uh, to figure out what the impact is going to be to your business and how you can mitigate some of that impact and then to strategize a route forward. That's, that's ultimately what it is. So I'll ask one more question and then we're going to get to uh, some of the live questions. Yeah. Um, one of our, in one of our previous webinars, we interviewed uh, Rob Puglise of mm -hmm. Jefferson University. Yeah, he's one a great the, guy. One of the things he mentioned was uh, the importance of looking to those reputable sources uh, for decision-making data. Yeah. Um, who are those reputable sources for you specifically in the manufacturing world? Um, he's in the medical world, so he mentioned the CDC, uh, but who are you looking for as, you know, I know this information has been vetted uh, and I can trust it. That's, it's, uh, it's more challenging. I think I'd have to maybe have you uh, elucidate that question a little bit more. The mm -hmm. medical questions still matter to us. So we do look to yeah. the CDC and to local hospital leaders to say kind of what they're doing. Um, for manufacturing, yeah, can you maybe give I me an say, idea? Of I can question. say more specifically for uh, demand. Um, how do you know what products you actually can produce? Yeah. Where is, where is that information being? Yeah. Done? Some of that, some of that is um, the FDA absolutely mm -hmm. has, uh, control over class one, class two, class three devices. Um, we've, we've done enough of the research and the consulting kind of on that space and then, and certainly made use of, of connections and, and other CEOs who are more familiar with it to help determine, you know, what the guidelines are. Mm -hmm. um, but even reaching out to the FDA themselves has been surprisingly, I shouldn't say so surprisingly, but surprisingly uh, transparent, you know, for mm -hmm. us, it was figuring out how to make an emergency ventilator based on uh, an MIT and New York consortium's design. 
how to make that here in Philadelphia. And, you know, for, for the guidelines that have been released under emergency use authorizations, that's, that is possible for a company like mine to do. It takes a lot of resources to get a project like that off the ground, um, which we're, we're uniquely capable of doing, but there's still a lot of uh, navigation of that kind of that red tape. Uh, despite how much of it's been cut, you still have to get quite a bit of it right. You know, they're not willing to accept yeah. just about anything. Um, yeah. And that's a project that, say it again? It's good. We, we want them to have some guidelines. <laughs> well, you would, yeah. Well, there, you know, there's, there's an amazing amount of, um, of power given to clinicians. You know? So at the point of care, a doctor is given very wide latitude on how to best care for their patient. And there's all kinds of clauses that, that the, um, I think it's the, the off-label use or the compassionate care clause or something like that, that, that a doctor is allowed to say to a patient's family, this is an untested device. This is not you know, used for, it's used in this environment, never in this environment, but the other option, the only other option is, is death. So, uh, and I've, I'm sure a clinician never phrases it like that, but my bedside manner is you know, fucking terrible. So. Um, so they would say, here, you have all the options on the table, and, and the FDA allows that. Now, when you're manufacturing something, you still want to have quality management systems in place so that every device you're, you're manufacturing is absolutely flawless, coming off the line, completely tested, no danger of, of electrical failure, systems failure, things like that. Uh, and that's what the FDA cares about. They care about those kinds of regulations, which um, we're lucky to be able to follow. But, hmm. but there's still more, more steps to that. Um, yes. process that, that have to take place. Well, at this point, we're going to switch over to uh, the online uh, live. Uh, so we'll go to the first question uh, of someone who took a look at your lookbook and liked it. Cool. Uh, you do have a great website. Thank you. Um, uh, asking if, do you focus on a specific area of engineering, uh, say biomechanical engineering, product manufacturing, engineering? Yeah, what is the main focus of Oat Foundry? Uh, yeah, I would say we certainly have the most competency in electromechanical fabric design and fabrication because of our involvement with split flaps. So these, you know, these devices are enormously complicated for how simple they look. You know, each sign, a four foot by uh, by eight foot sign, might have more than fifty thousand unique parts in it, and so getting the, all those to work for a long time. Um, in, in concert with each other is challenging. So that would be, you know, when you look at the core competencies there, you have mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, mold design, drafting, printed circuit board design, um, in addition to the normal things like procurement of off the shelf resources and project management. Oat Foundry's focus is on um, probably machines and automation more than anything. We have the most work based in food service technology also. Um, so we've built this pretty incredible cold brew coffee brewing machine that brews batches of cold brew or cold brew concentrate a hundred times faster, excuse me, for a, um, for a client in New Jersey. And so that, an example of that, that's, that's more of like the chemical engineering mindset. So it's, it's piping and instrumentation diagrams and it's ladder logic and, and um, PLC controls uh, in addition to UI. So what we do, what we say is to, to clients coming into Oat Foundry, you know, we're really good at designing and building something, and then we're good at helping you make the first 500. We are kind of a small scale contract manufacturer. It gets to a certain point where it makes financial sense for us to help shepherd you to the next, the next level up uh, from Oat Foundry, which might be one of these Mac molding houses or these larger contract manufacturers where they do everything in-house. They print all of their own circuit boards in-house. They have their own sheet metal bending. Um, and a way that we can provide value is the threshold is lower and the expectation of competency on a client side is lower. So we know you, you might come in with a napkin sketch, we can still help you out and we can get you to where you wanna be, which is all these great diagrams and designs and schematics that you would give to a larger manufacturer. So kind of a long-winded answer, but I hope I, I hope I helped you out. Yeah, actually a point of clarification was the scale of units and you said about 500 is where you, you yeah, have it's, the number limit. It, yeah, it, it's, it's uh, even saying 500, you know, the 500 of these, no problem. We do that, you know, monthly, 500, or probably more, less than, you know, weekly. For, for a cold brew coffee brewing system, you know, they're, they weigh 2,000 pounds and they're eight feet tall and four foot wide. We don't do 500 of those a month. Yeah. Um, so the scale ch changes depending on the product and the complexity, but, but you can kind of get a sense of 
uh, when we're evaluating a project, like, you know, we look in the back and we say, if we're making clocks or ventilators, the thing's this big, it's this big, you know, when you start to stack them up before they have to ship out the door, how much room does that take up? And you can just do some of these, these mental math numbers and see that we don't do mental math, we just use software for it, but you can see where it starts to eat up resources um, and get a sense of kind of how many of those you can make at a time. Hmm. So 500, 500 this big, fewer if it's larger, far more if it's smaller, uh, yeah, depends. Depends. Um, okay, your next question up is, uh, how did you guys design the face shield? Say, uh, say the question again? How did you design the face shield? Uh, so this one was, was maybe a little bit more rudimentary than our typical process. So typically we would go in through, um, you know, through our, our CAD software and we would start to do some digital drafting first, some industrial design first. Um, this was a lot more of this type of process. So getting a bunch of brain power in a room uh, or remotely into a room and whiteboarding as much as possible about kind of what features we really care about and what features we don't think matter as much to a customer. Um, and then all parts of design are, are really the same. You create assumptions and then you test those assumptions. So our assumption that, you know, the face shield needed to be this length was based on you know, someone leaning down while intubating a patient. And we found that for a larger doctor, that's great. For a smaller doctor, a clinician, nurse, anyone, that was, it's too long. Mm -hmm. And so it would end up, you know, they kind of hit their head a little bit. And then we weighed that and did some, some interviews with them and said, okay, if, if it's too long, um, but the risk of getting splash while intubating someone is too high, is that trade-off worth it? And so you do these types of conjoint analyses to, um, to kind of weigh apples to pineapples to face shields and see what the correct path is for mm. ultimately and we you know we do this during our, our meetings ultimately you need to make a thing and it is constrained by the physical constraints of the physical world so you can't have too much magic in but we do have these we have these phrases that we ask you know customers during meetings and we say if this was powered by magic what would it do like what would be the change mm -hmm. so yeah so the design process was truncated um, but mu much the same of our normal design process was there anywhere you went initially to look at other designs of face shields? I've seen a lot of makers coming up with a lot of designs. You mentioned earlier that often 11 designs are good. Um, so where did you look initially to get some inspiration? So this was, um, we, didn't, we didn't really look too many places for inspiration. I would say I, we really stuck to this philosophy of, um, I, like for sure we saw like on Reddit, on um, industrial design channels on a couple of the Slack channels, a lot of options coming out. You'd see them in the news. And my philosophy is great, build it, build it. That perfect, that one, excellent. Build that one too. Get them all out there because what matters is every time a doctor, a nurse, a shop right employee is standing there and someone coughs or sneezes, every opportunity they have for that vector to get in their system is, is an opportunity that we can prevent. So the speed to market mattered to us more than the precise design of whatever the actual product was. And then this, the scale is a tough one because, you know, I, I, um, we've talked to a lot of makers who, are, who have said, you know, I'm making these in my basement and, and uh, I'm doing 10 a day. And we go, perfect. That's 10 more people who aren't going to be splashed on. And then mm -hmm. they go, but you're making thousands a day. You're having more of an impact. I don't, not necessarily more of an impact because even at my level, there's other companies above us that are making yeah. a million a, a week or whatever the number is. And I just say, perfect. This is yeah. great. This is all good news because it means that there's fewer people getting splashed on or coughed on or um, having an exposure to any kind of, um, any kind of vector. Uh, and so my, my advice would be use the tools you got in front of you and do the best you can. Don't get discouraged if there's someone else doing more or less than you mm -hmm. um, because it's, it really what matters is you know, for us, we even said, hey, the best way to make these is probably die cutting. It's not routing. Die cutting is definitely, but it's going to take us a week to get a die or more, two weeks to get a die. And, and the cost, the, the ratios don't work for being able to buy the plastic at this rate and having to, you know, you can't sell it for 30 bucks because it's, mm -hmm. it's not that type of product. Um, and so that kind of comes back to this, use the tools in front of have, you have in front of you, but ultimately just start making them. <laughs> just get them built. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I know from uh, NextFab's point of view, we've slowly uh, increased how fast our production could go by getting eventually a die cut. But initially, right. we didn't want to look into that because we didn't have the tool. Right. Um, 
but then now you have it and you can probably make thousands more. Yes. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, next question we have is what mistakes, uh, either in practice mode, either in practice or mode of thinking aroused for your team uh, through the process of pivoting uh, in these last several weeks? I guess what mistakes did you make? Mm. How did yeah. you overcome them? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so one I would say is, uh, is it's, it's really easy to slip into uh, making it a more complicated version than it has to be. Uh -huh. um, so in the beginning, you know, we were, we were lasering a lot of these, the rubber strap. So ours, they have this rubber strap mm -hmm. and it's, it's riveted on. So it's, it's like a pretty, it's a pretty sturdy thing, but the rubber, you have to um, cut that in some way. And so in the beginning, we were doing it all by hand, uh -huh. um, which is, a horrible, I mean, it's an awful way to do it. Like you're banging each hole in by hand and it's, it's time consuming. And so doing that, you know, now that we get the benefit of hindsight, we can look back and say, that was probably the wrong way to do that. But it was also what we had at the time. So we didn't have these other resources at the time. Um, and so to be able to get, following our initial philosophy of get them out as fast as possible, that, that was the tool that we were using. When we started jumping into um, using the laser for them. We're like, oh my God, we can laser cut these. We can do hundreds more. Actually, the better move at that point would have been to, to go into the uh, die cutting system or something similar where we can actually start slicing them. I know, uh, you know a lot of people don't have access to injection molding systems, but they do have access to 3D printers. 3D printers are great and they can print a lot of these things out. It's not going to end up being as many as an, an injection molding system could do for, for that cost ratio. Um, but you look and you say, but I don't have an injection molding system. That might be the best way to do it. It might be the least expensive and the fastest way to do it. Um, and so I would say we, we've, we've taken kind of some of these lessons and then other ones uh, we've had to, to kind of discard is if we look and we say this core assumption of getting them in as fast as possible, getting in something that works as fast as possible, that's reusable. If that's our core assumption, then we're not going to wait two weeks for a mold to be made. Mm -hmm. to injection mold these things. We're just going to start building them. Got it. Uh, sort of on the same similar topic, did you have any aha moments over the past few weeks? Uh, aha moments. Um, what would I say is an aha moment? I don't, yeah, it's a good question. I saw that one come through from Alex. Yeah. I think... Um, I think probably the, the best aha moment was when, um, when we realized that, that we could produce, like we never had like an aha moment, like I wish, um, like, actually I can give you an example. Um, so these come with, with a cover on them. So the Lexan ships with this protective cover on it. Um, in the beginning, we were taking those off and bagging them up and sending them out. And we had this aha moment of like, Actually, someone who receives this would probably want to do that themselves. They get to peel it off like a new TV or iPhone or whatever and see how clean and clear it is. Um, so that's like a time-saving thing for us that is also a benefit to the customer. Um, in the beginning, we used to dunk these all in bleach and let them rest before we sent them out the door. Um, now we've stopped doing that. We've just said, everyone who gets them, please wash them with soap and water before you use them, um, which was kind of the assumption was we'll ship them in bleach, we'll package them, and then we'll ship them out the door. So they're like good to go from the moment that they leave our shop. Mm -hmm. but the liability doesn't make sense. You'd have to have so many more controls over the product to be able to really make that claim in a yeah. way that you could back up. And so we said, nope, the liability has to stay on the user side. You can just dunk it in soap and water or dunk it in bleach when you get it. And then you know, you know for certain that you're good to go. So there's a couple moments mm -hmm. of like changing the product along the way. Um, that would be that would end up being better for the, the person using it. Yeah, it, I have to say it's been interesting watching um, the difference in level of service based on what people are now comfortable with uh, hygienically. Like, like you mentioned, cleaning the product when you initially get it that right. beforehand would be a great service. Um, mm -hmm. But now people are saying, I would rather do it myself because I know it's done. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how products change uh, in their delivery. Right. After you, know, you know, it's done your own way, the way yes. you want it. Right. Yeah. I do have one more question. Uh, that Go ahead. Through. Uh, and if anyone has specific questions, these have been great uh, about anything that you're encountering and problems, please feel free to put them in. 
I have questions of my own though, so I can keep going. Um, if he, if we have a different use case for the split flap display, Oat Foundry, uh, is this Oat Foundry can accommodate or can they create something else? I guess how flexible is that design and is it something that could be, you know, the, me the mechanics, can that be yeah. used for other types of? Equipment? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's one that we've, we've begun to solve ourselves internally, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the split flaps even of themselves are, it's an electromechanical display, but they're used, it's a myriad uses that we see of bars and restaurants and hotels and all of the businesses that are really suffering right now, but then also corporate interiors and also events and things like um, uh, art. You know, we have a couple in art environments where it's used in a, in a part of a show, um, in media, things like that. So there's, there's different basically channels that we can sell them in, used, given their existing functionality. Um, there's also the core functionality of having motors spin flaps. We've found a couple ways that we can uh, we can change kind of what the product is and and find some new life for it. So that's split flaps aren't going away. Even while we've been you know uh, this past month, we we are still selling them to people who want them for everything from from athletic facilities to corporate interiors to bars that are going to be opening up six months from now. So the cycle is a lot longer than just um, one month or so right now, but with the core competency of Oatfinder that led to the development of this product, that's the, that's the service really that we are, um, that we're most excited to share with, with companies now is, hey, we, we have the ability to make these great things and produce them at scale. What can we build for you? It's hmm. good to know. Okay, we'll wait for a few more questions to roll in, um, but I have questions about specifically the face shield. Sure. Um, a lot of what we've been seeing is uh, people using really specific materials. How did you choose those materials? Was it the need and what's available? Uh, yeah. And why are they good for the medical industry? Yeah, um, so part of that is requirements and specifications for the product. So when you look, you say the requirement is um, driven by ANSI, uh, it's, the, it's the splash protection, Z87. I forget what the actual number is. Um, so it's a guideline for sp splash protection. So that gives you a sense of geometry, how much it has to cover the side of your face. Um, for thickness, that's like a big part of the, the design of these is not just optical clarity, right? But also the thickness of this plastic. And so we did, you end up going with a, a more heuristic test. You get 10 different thicknesses and you share them with people and you say, what do you think of these? And you get kind of a big clumping around one or two thicknesses and they, the, the people say, well, we like this thickness the best. That's, that's what we want to use. Um, there's a trade-off with weight. So the thicker you go, the heavier something is. Um, so there's a trade-off with weight where given a longer product development cycle, we probably have users you know, wear this for 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, four hours a day to get a sense of like what the ergonomic fatigue is on their body. That's part of an industrial design study. And so we had to kind of truncate that as much as possible and, have someone wear it for some amount of time. We were wearing them in the office for some amount of time to see how, how comfortable or uncomfortable they are. And when we became satisfied with our design, um, that's what we, we used. Contemporaneously with that, or I'm sorry, simultaneously with that was reaching out to, to plastic suppliers and saying, you know, okay, if the, um, you know, if the 10,000 thick polycarbonate, if that's sold out, what, what, what else you got? And they would say, well, we have these other 15 kinds of plastic you can buy. And, you know, this one has these properties and this one has these properties. And so that's part of the, the engineering design process to whittle those down into a, a couple categories that work. And really, you do want redundancy. You don't want to just choose one that's super expensive and go with that. You want to choose a couple that are about the same price um, from different suppliers so that you can, you can have some sense of safety about your supply chain. Hmm. We have one more question that just came in. Um, if someone wants to discuss uh, the production of a product with Oat Foundry, uh, who should they contact? Um, and I also, just a follow up question to this is, you know, are you planning on doing more collaborative projects for the COVID crisis? I know you mentioned one prior, uh, but are you looking for more ideas for this? Yeah, so the, the, to answer the first question um, for the person who asked it, 
on our website, it's oatfoundry.com and you can scroll down and you can see the, the contact us um, form. You can also send an email to josh at oatfoundry.com, J-O-S-H, uh, or me, mark at oatfoundry.com and we'll be able to, to get into the right conversation. For, um, for other projects, so, so yes, um, to answer your question, we are looking at other projects. The challenge we see, so, so Oat Foundry, you know, we typically help customers find funding for these projects later on. So we're, we're not this like super rich entity that can fund these kind of endlessly. Um, we do as much as possible try to, like my partners and I are like, let's dump money. Like we're gonna put the money in to get these things up and started and all the rest of it so we can get these off the ground. What we say is, um, is we can, we're really good at helping think through not just the, the technical feasibility of a project, but also some of the financial feasibility. There are groups out there that are funding some of these projects and what they need to see um, to be able to, to do that. So what, so for example, uh, we wanna make a giant, uh, let's see, uh, something like a, a, a pod that's like a mobile medical facility or something like that. It's a cool project, but it might cost 10 to $50,000 to outfit something like that, um, which is sometimes beyond the, the scale for um, for an individual. So then we say, well, what do you need to be able to go find funding for this? Do you need schematics, drawing? Do you need a website set up that explains what your value proposition is? We can help with that to then empower you to go to this next um, this next step, which is getting some groundswell around whatever that that idea is. So for people who uh, want to be involved in this effort, what is the best way? for them to either interact with you or what would you say the call to action is for them? Yeah, I think, um, so if you're, if you're an individual with technical competency, um, I would encourage you to join the, the Cover Aid PHL Slack channel and maybe Anna, you can um, help link to people to that. That's, that's the local effort that was started by, um, by Evan from NextFab and a few others. Um, I know Mel Biotto is on there and Kendall is on there. Um, kind of local, local titans of the maker community uh, and the fabrication community, and they are helping air traffic control some of these um, individual efforts. If you're a company that's looking to help, there's kind of a couple ways you can. Um, you can certainly help with, with money and you can donate money to be able to fund Oat Foundry face shields. We'll give them away to, um, to the hospitals. Um, I'm sure there, I think there are a lot of other communities out there taking that are doing fundraising um, around this too. I think Cover Aid has their own uh, group that's doing some of the nonprofit work. So there, there are resources out there. I would say you can reach out to Oat Foundry, to me, and I can help point you in the right direction personally. Um, you can look through some of the, um, some of the Slack channels and, and find, find whatever works best for you to, to help the most. Um, and for everyone who uh, is curious about those links, I have been posting them in the chat. Uh, and when we post this episode uh, and the recording, afterwards, we'll also include those there. Yeah. Um, and please feel free to reach out to Mark or Josh. Yeah. Um, Josh so is great. He's, he's a, huh? uh, so Josh is our, our director of business development, huh? but he is a phenomenal guitar player. And so he led a, um, a happy hour, like a Zoom happy hour, I think it was last week or two weeks ago. And he's going to do another one soon because they're so much fun, but he just can play every song. So in the, the chat, people will be, play us, give us a 90s hit or something like that. And he'll just immediately go into it. Um, and so it's, it's impressive to see, but it also really lives out one of our um, core values of just having fun. Um, yeah. So he's, he's just a cool guy that if you reach out to him, he's, he's worth having a chat with. Yeah. And send him your music request too. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> uh, well, if we don't have any more questions from the audience, I have one more. Sure. We've been talking a little bit about, you know, your aha moments and your mistakes. Uh, what is, what have you found most challenging uh, in this time? And what do you think actually fits, you know, your skill set the best? Mm -hmm. uh, what have you learned good, about yourself? Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, before COVID, we would say, don't let people change your process. Because you've spent all this time developing this process and honing this process. Don't let a new customer affect your process, don't let a new employee affect your process um, in some dramatic, acute way, right? Mm -hmm. And what I realized is I was spending time, I, I, I was not following that philosophy. I was spending time in the beginning, you know, worrying unnecessarily or like wait, waiting for other people to do things. I'm like, no, we are, 
especially in my position at Oat Foundry is just as a leader at Oat Foundry. It's not, I'm not trying to be self-aggrandizing. It's like, no, I have employees who look to me to say, What's, what should we do? And partners who are like, give us the best advice on what to do. Um, and so instead of like going on the back pedal, switching that conversation and saying, no, it's time to do your job, lead, figure out what the next plan of action is and then make that plan a reality. Um, and so I would say, don't lose yourself. Remember who you are. This, all of this doesn't change who we are. Uh, it, it might reveal some things you haven't known about yourself or uh, some new nuances of an interpersonal relationship, um, but don't forget who you are because you're gonna have to go back to that person and the person you wanna look back on, uh, you wanna be proud of too. Yeah, what has helped you uh, remind yourself of this? Right. Is it your team? Is it your routine? Yeah, uh, it's, it is. It's my team. It is my routine. Um, I'm close with my family, so it's certainly my family. Um, remembering that we don't have to talk about coronavirus every time we talk about something. We can still talk about the funny memes that we're seeing. Um, we can still throw on crazy Snapchat filters uh, when we're doing Zoom family calls. So there's sort of a, uh, like, that. that's that uh, kind of that don't forget yourself mentality of, it's, it's okay. Um, I'm going to see if I can throw on a potato. Let me see. I have to say, I, I personally have been being tricked into thinking people are in like lovely tropical places. <laughs> <laughs> the backgrounds are getting better than a uh, more. Uh, yeah. Let me see if I can turn this on. Maybe it's, maybe it's not going to work for me today. Uh. Maybe snap staff camera is done. Uh, well, all right, I'll go back to my normal video. So anyways, that the, the point is, um, have fun too. Like, don't, don't forget to, you're, you're allowed to. There's a lot of bad things happening in the world right now, but you can give yourself permission to, um, to also have fun. That's okay. Yeah. And that, sometimes that helps ground us in, in ways that we, we maybe could not have forecast before. That's very true. Yeah. That's good advice. Well, we're just about at time. Um, I want to thank you, Mark, for joining us for this hour. I know you're busy uh, making face shields and sending them out to people who need them. Uh, so for anyone who has, again, uh, questions for Mark or ideas or wants to contact Oak Foundry, you can go to their website, which I have linked in the chat. Um, like I mentioned, we will be posting this episode and the recording. So please feel free to share it, especially if you know people who have small scale manufacturers here or around the world. Uh, this kind of information is going to be really helpful for them in the next coming months. Uh, we will also be continuing this webinar series, so keep an eye out for uh, future episodes. And thank you. And it was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, and I, I like these webinar series too. I think you guys are doing a great job with that. So similarly, keep up the good work. Thank you. Everyone right. stay safe. <laughs> Take care. Goodbye. Bye -bye.